things escalated, the numbers. We only went in to help a couple of families. While we were there, we were approached by a group of armed Taliban. Challenging times don't last. You, you, you will look back at them and think, oh. Um, I also shook the hand of one of the guys who tortured me, a young guy on the way out, one of the Taliban. And how are you, brother? Oh, Chris, how's it going, mate? How's it going, your part of the world? Yes, mate. I, I, I'm never going to complain. Um, I think we should uh, start by saying congratulations on your nomination on the uh, UK Veterans Awards. I and congratulations on you being being uh, nominated as well, mate. <laughs> we're, we're in the same category. Snap. <laughs> it is good, isn't it? Well. Um, yeah, I'm not, I, I think probably like yourself, mate, I'm not big on this sort of, I, I certainly don't seek it, but then in fairness, I guess it is nice to be recognised for what you do because otherwise not much point in doing it. <laughs> well, no, there is, there's a whole, 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 I'm, 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 uh, contradicting myself but what i mean is you know yeah it is nice to be to have people that appreciate what you do and i'm very fortunate to get lots of messages from people that um have appreciate what i do what my charity stuff's done what what we did throughout the last 24 months of of uh chaos can i say it's a bit surprising do you know this year they had more nominees for veteran of the year um than any other any other year i wasn't aware of a lot of it because obviously for the past nine nine months i was in afghanistan so i'm kind of a little bit um behind the the loop as they say but any anything to shine a light on veteran issues the veteran community in a positive way is great and it's actually amazing that both of us have been nominated and both of us have been able to bring a load of positivity with a lot of other veterans into the veteran community as well. You literally, that was the second part of what I started to say then. And as usual, I forgot what I was going to say. It's not the first time, folks, is it? Um, but no, if we can bring any light into veterans' lives um, yeah. and also enlighten the public as to, you know, it, it, veterans are a unique breed. We, 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 uh, many people come from incredibly damaged backgrounds to join the forces. You go through some stuff, let's just call it, when you, you're, like, you're just a teenager, you know, you, 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 you're going through some of the most serious decision making you'll ever have to make in your life not just over your life but over other people's lives and and like you know you're not far out your bloody nappies <laughs> so yeah. if we can um in any way put a message of light out there for people especially you know obviously those that are struggling um and as i always say you know challenging times don't last you 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 will look back at them and think, oh, you know, ha ha, can't believe I went, you know, can't believe I. And the big thing, Ant, isn't it, is reach out, reach out, just find someone that's a good, a, a good guy. Good or, or the other day, I reached out to a very good friend of mine. Hello, Kathy, if you're watching, and I just I just wanted to chat with someone, you know impartial whatever and just put a few things to them and it's good to know you're not alone yeah i think i think that's the that's the important message for any of the veterans who are actually who are watching this you're not alone there's loads of us out there pick up pick up the phone speak to someone you know we all have bad days i get them chris you get them everyone gets them 
thing is, it's to share it and have a chat with one of the guys as well. It's it's important. Yes, yes. So, Anne, you you very came, kindly came on the podcast before. We learned a bit about your background, former para. Um, I'm going to be honest, mate. It was such a long time ago. I can't remember what the, the other than the fact you've got a fascinating story, which has just got even more fascinating in the in 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 the last year or or or, or so. Um, but you know, you're no stranger to the Middle East, are you? Or 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 being locked up in a in a Middle Eastern prison? No, um, obviously, following I think Stephen Malone for the viewers out there who don't actually know me, um, I'm a veteran of the British Parachute Regiment, embedded combat photographer with 101st Airborne during the Iraq War. I then worked alongside and with the American intelligence throughout several different countries. I specialised in Iraq and Afghanistan. I ended up spending th- three years in a maximum security prison in Afghanistan. Refused to pay a bribe to be released, so I ended up staying in there, working and helping American and British intelligence, putting information back, uh, which obviously helped to save a lot of lives. Then about 2010, uh, 2011, I retired from all sort of work um, to do with the military, the government, intelligence. So for the past 10 years, I've not been involved. I've been dedicating my time to... Patriot, which is a which is a private little organisation that helps military veterans, the families, and the children, especially homeless veterans or veterans with PTSD. And for ten years, pretty much been focused on that, just trying to give back, turn everything around, and actually help as many people as we possibly can. Then, about a year ago, to uh, this month is the year anniversary of British troops being pulled out of Afghanistan. Over a year ago, I was still retired, but I started receiving telephone calls, sat- satellite phone calls from colonels, brigadier generals, and some senior members of the former Afghan regime. Now, obviously, everyone's seen the, the actual news about the evacuation, Absolute carnage. Um, we're very kind of unorganised and it, everyone's seen it on BBC and Sky and all, all that as well. Now, I started to help get a couple of people out and it was literally going to be a couple of families and that was it. No intention on going over there. But the numbers started to increase exp- exponentially. Um, a family of four ended up moving a a family of 10. Then we ended up moving another 10 families on top of that. That's before you even got out of England. Then I made the command decision myself and some other veterans. Um, Like a lot of other veterans out there, American and British, the evacuation and the way it was unfolding didn't sit well with a lot of us. We never leave a man behind ever. And we were receiving phone calls from interpreters, our old drivers, the families. And these are people who I know very, very well, who I've always kept in contact with. And these families now have got young ch- children. And the Taliban were actively hunting some of these individuals at this time. So I made a command decision to go to Afghanistan on a self-funded humanitarian mission, and we call that Operation Patriot. Operation Patriot successfully managed to locate and move over 400 families, including many vulnerable children, to safe locations, safe houses, and we managed to get a lot of them out of Afghanistan to third world countries. We were working alongside a lot of other organisations, a lot of groups. It was basically... All men, all veterans, man the pumps, and we did whatever we had to do to help get as many people as we can. It was a drop in the actual ocean. Mm-hmm. When we were there, I went into one meeting in Jalalabad, and that was to actually meet with, with a colleague, four British nationals, 
within an hour of that meeting, we had discovered 74 other British nationals, passport holders, dual nationals, Afghan British, and they had their families. So you can imagine the numbers just increased exponentially. So we worked with government agencies and anyone out there to try and help get as many people out as we can. Now, I was only meant to be there for two months, three months maximum. Then I was I was out of there. Uh, let's say we were there purely humanitarian. Now, at the end of the three-month point, me and my colleague were actually looking at a house to rent, which was the former British ambassador's residence in Kabul, which is owned by an Afghan, which was for rent at that time. We were approached by members of the Taliban, another tribal element within the Taliban. Yeah, myself and my colleague were looking at the former British ambassador's residence in Kabul. We were looking at, at, at renting that, and we were approached by an element within the Taliban at that time who a few of them came over wanting to check our identification. Not a problem. Got our British passports out. We had entry visas in there. We had letters of permission from the Taliban government to be in Kabul at that point and other identification. They then wanted to confirm a couple of key points, which is not a problem. So we were asked to accompany them voluntarily to the Afghan head of intelligence, his headquarters in Kabul, which is literally just around the corner. Uh, what we thought would say a couple of hours to sort out, it didn't put in a holding cell. 190 days later, we were then taken to the airport and we, we left Afghanistan. So that's the overview. <laughs> so you can imagine the chaos that all this has caused. And I'm just going to clarify for our friends at home. So, folks, Ant's gone over there because, as we all know, the Americans and allies just like literally pulled out of Afghanistan, like almost like that. Um, not only did they leave behind the most well equipped military force in the world, i.e. the Taliban now with all, all the equipment left behind, which is slightly ironic for those of you that are old enough to remember the reasons we went into Afghanistan, which was to stop the the errorism if i say that so we don't get flagged um but of course all the individuals who had been part of that military um operation afghan citizens so interpreters you know fixers etc 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 who are um uh, and and can explain this but are deemed eligible for british passports american passports whatever whatever the case may be we're all left behind um and if you think about the work that they'd done for the americans for best part of 20 years to be left to the taliban is i think you know i think we can all picture the scene just absolutely terrifying so Ant's gone over there um, and has been enabling these individuals out to to essentially emigrate, leave the country, um, find somewhere safe. And in this process, you've been arrested yourself. Yeah, well, we got arrested, but we were never formally charged with anything. We were we were not prisoners. There was six British nationals altogether, one American, that, that was uh, that was Paul. Me and my colleague, we did not know the other people that got pulled, but we got pulled purely being in the wrong place at the wrong time. We had a British passport. We found out afterwards that they were trying to round up as many British nationals from a particular hotel and an area that they could because their objective was to use us as political kind of points. So their objective was to get us and to hold us as um, political hostages. 
So that became apparent very early on. They did not even realise who I was until after the two-week point. Then all hell breaks. It was obviously because I'm travelling under my real name. I had already met prior to me being pulled in Kabul. I had already met six senior members of the Taliban. I'd already met senior members of the Haqqani family as well, multiple members of that network in Kabul. I even had been invited in with my colleague and we had had a meeting and a cup of tea in the presidential palace as well. So we were not doing anything covert whatsoever. We were there, humanitarian, getting as many people out as we could. But there was an element, and still is an element, an extremist element out there as well, which doesn't want a lot of these people to actually leave. So instead of targeting the people that were leaving, the element within the Taliban were trying to target the people that were helping them on the ground. There's supposed to be an, an, an amnesty. I would have a question mark with that, because if you work for the former re regime in senior positions or you're on a blacklist, blacklist, we call it, which the Taliban are hunting, then you're going to have some serious problems there. We we actually personally saw a lot of um, a lot of ill ill treatment and beatings by the Taliban on other Afghans. I obviously got given an hard time because I'm a former British soldier. And my interrogator was from southern Afghanistan and he had a personal problem with anybody that had served in either the American military or specifically the British military because he had a personal running with British soldiers in southern Afghanistan. So me and this particular individual did not get, get on at all mm -hmm. um, from day one, week one. But... That's one of those things. It happens. Um, I think your viewers have got to also understand the Taliban. A lot of people, especially like the Western press, call it the Taliban government. It's The Taliban is an umbrella organization which covers a lot of different groups, tribes, tribal system, and networks, including the Akani network as well. So there's not a fully inclusive, comprehensive government running Afghanistan as of now. And that's my opinion, and I've been there, seen it, Mark, World War One, I, I bought. There's that much infighting going on between the inside the Taliban. It is remnants of what I saw back in 1999, 2000. It is, a, it is now went back along the tribal systems. Give an example. This is the worst that I've actually ever experienced it. Just in the building we were in, each floor was pretty much ran by a different tribal element within the Taliban. That's just the building I was in. You imagine that's expanded across Kabul, then expanded again across Afghanistan. Mm. The amount of infighting going on at the moment is phenomenal. On top of that, you've got the fighting going on between the Al-Qaeda and the Akani network. Then you've got an armed resistance there as well. So it's going to take quite a long time for the dust to settle. Did you see, and I'm just going on a slight tangent here but, but, so I don't forget this, but it is quite important. Did you see many Chinese nationals there? Yes, we we did see some Chinese businessmen and government mm. officials in Kabul meeting with senior members of the Taliban. Yes. So, again, I'm just talking for my friends at home here, Ant, but we've talked about this a lot before. It's really worth understanding the Belt and Road Initiative, the superhighway from China into Europe. Um, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, I'm the all seeing eye on 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 all of it but it has been said that the americans went in to smash the country up basically to make way for the chinese to come and do business for things like uh, lithium mining etc etc 
once again, order out of chaos. I don't think you're supposed to understand it all, but it is interesting, Ant, that that you've seen Chinese businessmen um, there. Do you know what their deal, what their dealings would have been? I'm, I'm not. I, I wouldn't expect you to, but. I'm not going to speculate. I'm just going to go on what I actually know, what I heard, and what I actually saw as well. Mm. Now, the a lot of Chinese government officials were trying to get close to a lot of the members of the Taliban. They were using money as a financial incentive, uh, money and properties as well. The the, the Chinese government's been offer, offering offering properties in multiple countries to anyone in Taliban government who can help them. Uh, yeah. it's, it, it's not a secret, it's out there. The Chinese are very interested in the natural resources in Afghanistan. You've got copper, you've got lithium, you've got a lot of other natural resources there as well. But the problem is that the Chinese have already been in senior talks, both in Afghanistan and there was a Taliban delegation about six months ago that went from Kabul to China as, as well. So they, they they are in talks. But the problem any country is going to have is who's going to want to invest in a country where it's not stable, the security situation is deteriorating, the economy is deteriorating as, as well. Now, the Taliban were telling the Chinese that everything has been okay and it's okay to in, invest in country. The Chinese promised a large amount of, of money, which was hundreds of millions, to be given to the Taliban. Some of, some of that, and it is a small amount, has changed hands, but a lot of it has not. Everyone's just pulling back the actual reins and watching what happens. Mm. Um and it'll be very interesting because you haven't just got the Chi Chinese who are in in interested in the natural resources in Afghanistan. You've got the Americans, you've got the British and other European countries all trying to talk to the Taliban to try and see what, what they can do. Now, the economy in Afghanistan it is, it is being spiralling down. Inflation has been spiraling as well. Within the past six months, basic necessities are very similar to what's happened in England. Fuel and food has doubled or quadrupled in price in Afghanistan. So there is now a massive shortage of food and aid is required for the Afghan people. I am not pro-Taliban. Anyone who knows me knows that. But I am pro Afghanistan for the for the people. So I think Western governments need to have a good long hard look at themselves and think how can they help or resolve this. I understand that nobody Western wants to recognise the Taliban government. I get that, but opening up a dialogue is important because can we afford not to have a dialogue? with the Taliban, okay? The dust will settle in a week or so's time. We, everyone knows the leader of Al-Qaeda was killed in Kabul. Speculation is it was in one of the Haqqani's like, residences. Um, my personal opinion is I think he actually was. But the dust will settle on this, and then people have to have a cool head and move forward on it because the Western countries could not afford not to engage with the Taliban at this time. Because if we don't, within six months, in my opinion, there will be civil war in Afghanistan, and it will become even more of an extremist country, which will harbour a lot of terrorist organisations. Mm -hmm. So we need to really think about can we afford in the West not to engage? Yes, my God. There's so much to unpick there. Um, again, and just for, my, for our friends at home here, so like 
uh, it, Afst- Afghanistan is a, is a proud nation with a very long history of conflict. Yeah, for the most part, put upon them by by other nations, as they always say, "You wear the watches, we've got the time." Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to read some of the the books on the conflict. There's a book called I think it's called The Bear Trap or The Bear Claw, and it's the Bear Trap. Um, it's written about the Soviet occupation or invasion of Afghanistan. Talks about how hard these people are. They'll go. Uh, they don't. They don't favour traditional um, battle tactics simply because it doesn't. It it, it it doesn't work. So they're more the kind of hit and run raids. But if one of them gets shot by an American bullet, Russian bullet, so on and so forth. They have to understand they might have to be carried on a donkey or a horse for six days before they even can get to a hospital. Not nothing like what we understand. You know, you're shot on a battlefield within 20 minutes. You're in a Chinook and and within a day you're back in the UK in in one of the top hospitals. Fascinating, fascinating culture. Um, I, I personally, I don't believe the mainstream. I don't think there was. Um, I don't think this p- country was of any threat to us back 20 years ago, nor did I think that they were cultivating these massive camps of, uh, you know, fighting people that were all going to come and attack me and my family in my bed. But I don't want to go down that route because I, I, I want to hear Ant, get more into Ant's story. Um, but you can see now, Everyone has to get by, whether that's the Taliban government, government in Africa, when people are starving and they need food, then you're going down that line again, aren't you? Like I I worked in Mozambique, every grain sack, all the aid had the American flag on it. So what deal had been done there with the president of Mozambique to keep the people happy what was being taken out of that country to the USA, et cetera, et cetera. Then, of course, you get international finance. The World Bank come, comes in into these things. So it it is, um, you know, this is the nature of these things. I don't, I don't think anyone thinks it's uh, straightforward. Um, it's a quagmire. It's a quagmire and... As with anything in the world, the rich get richer, don't they? And the poor, poor stay poor, and and, and the yeah. poor, poor die in poverty. But back to your story, Anne, because this is um, incredible. So, were you able to save the other chap that you were locked up with? Was it was it just one guy, or was it a few? Uh, I'm not going to drop any names on here. Some of them have been in the press against their families consent uh and these are friends of mine so i'm not going to mention any names on this interview yeah no 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 we, we don't want to get any anybody into any trouble I, i'm just trying to build a picture here so what kind of conditions were, were you in um you know were you like in a dark room what what kind of food was the food okay or, or i mean for you you're you're very experienced in that part of the world i'm i'm sure you can eat it all but I was, I was quite fortunate because the gentleman who, who I was with, uh, I've known him for a long time. And um, between me and this gentleman, we have over 65 years joined on and off experience in Af- Afghanistan. I, I've only got 22 years on and off in Afghanistan, 32 years military, hostile environment experience. Now, between both of us, it was a bit of a unusual situation because... We know the country, we know the players, but we didn't know the amount of infighting that was going on within the Taliban or the Taliban against the Afghanis. It was a very, and not many people do understand it or could even get their head around what was going on, what is going on within the Afghan government at this time. We were actually kept for 190 days in an underground Taliban interrogation centre in Kabul. We were locked up for 23 and a half hours every day. We had no natural daylight or sunlight. I was kept in solitary confinement after one of the beatings I received. 
for 70 days until my wounds had healed externally. Then I was moved back in with my friend as well, who's also very experienced uh, in Afghanistan, British national. There was over, there was another five British nationals in there as well. All of us kept in the same corridor. So we got to speak to each other sporadically, but we kept tabs on each other and we all knew what each other were up to, what was going on and the, tr the treatment between us all as well. I got singled out purely because I was a former British power and my interrogator had a massive problem with military guys who had, who had been connected to Parliament at that time. So for him, it wasn't a job. It was a very personal thing. Um, so, yeah, a bit of an hard time with that one. The food was rice and beans. Um, stable diet of that. I went in, I weighed 98 kilo. I came out, I was just, on, just over 70. So it was the best slim fast plan I've ever seen. All right. Um, conditions were pretty barbaric. The treatment at the time was harsh for myself and the other guys who were kept hostage. But it was the being stuck or on, on the ground, not knowing what the hell was going on. 23 and a half hours a day. It can it can play with your mind a little bit. So some of us fared a lot better. There was a couple of us in there who the guys, no fault of their own, they just didn't deal with it that well. I'm not going to mention any names. It's just it's one of those one of those things. Um, myself and my colleague were quite fortunate, and we have a lot of experience in Afghanistan, the food, the culture. So we had a basic understanding and knowledge of what to expect. Um, the first couple of months were, like I said, were harsh at times. Was there a time where I thought they were going to take us outside and shoot us in the head? Absolutely, yes. There was a couple of times where we thought this might not be a good a good day here because the interrogators were angry. There'd be other things happening outside of our control in Afghanistan. And it wouldn't have surprised us if they dragged one of us out. Um, but in that situation, you can either curl up and die in the corner and cry, or you roll up your sleeves, keep a positive attitude, and you crack on. So fortunately, able to roll up your sleeves, get on with it, and keep the guys as motivated and in a good mindset as what we possibly can. I'm quite fortunate. I'm uh, ex-power very dark sense of humour, always trying to kind of keep everyone as upbeat as we can. As far as I'm concerned, there's no point in crying, there's no point in sitting in, in, in the corner, all right? Because what I told the guys when we were in there was, how are you acting here right now? How you are, what you say, what you do. When this ends, and it will end, this will pass, people will remember how you've acted. So I said, bear that in mind when you go upstairs for interrogation and bear that in mind in your general dealings with the guards and everybody else. And I was really spot on with that because now everyone's out. Everyone did get released back home to safe with the families. Um, and I've told the guys to try and take as much time as they can, a couple of months if need be, get themselves back into normal civilian life and I'm just going to put all this down as a life experience. Life saved, job done. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Yes, you've got a good head on your shoulders, though, Anne, and you are incredibly positive. I mean, every time I've spoken to you, you're massively, like, all, all, always in the upbeat. And, uh, and it's good because life can be a bit can get all of us down at times you know and it's uh it, it's a it, it you're a good guy aren't you know chris don't forget though all of us have our good and bad days when i was inside i had a couple of bad days everyone gets them the rest of the guys picked me up and said i come on 
I it lasted a very short period of time because I'm mm. like, you know, some embolics, roll up the sleeves, this, get on with it. So, yeah, everyone gets the good and bad, bad days, mate. If anyone out there tells you they don't ever get a bad day, eh, don't think they're telling the truth on that one, mate. Mm. But like I said, my personal opinion is just try and keep as uppy as you can. It will pass. The sun will sh- shine in the morning. And hell, if they did take us outside and shoot us at the back of the head, that would have been the end of it. I wouldn't have had anything else to be concerned about. So there's no point in worrying about something if it hasn't happened. Mm. So the way I looked at it was, yeah, um, it was an educational experience. It was emotional at times, but it was very insightful into how the Taliban government operates internally, who the main key players are because at one point the communication between the British Foreign Office and the Taliban broke down completely they were not talking to each other consulate services access was completely de- denied and stopped because um, the Taliban were upset about a variety of things so myself and my po- colleagues managed to get a couple of key members of the t- t- Taliban into one place. We managed to get a phone call to the FCO at that point, head of the Afghan desk. He was a great guy. He was not expecting a phone call off me. And I said, right, this is who I am. You know who I am. Um, got the other a couple of British nationals here. I've got the Taliban here as well. Um, I think you guys ought to start talking. And that, that was the point where things started to Start to go fairly well, as in positive for us being released. One of my colleagues who got who got released a week or so before the rest of us, and that was kept very very quiet. He was able to guide the the foreign office into so British foreign office to who he really needed to speak to, because that's the big problem at the moment. How do you know who to talk to? in a new government, in a country, you, you don't have any di- diplomatic ties with. So we were able to point everyone in the right directions. The good people to talk to, they're not so good, as in these are the guys you don't want anything to do with. These are the guys who can make the decision. So it all turned out okay in the end of it. Um, but like I said, like, well, like what, what you said, Chris, Afghanistan, a very complicated country with a lot of a lot of history. It's a warring nation, and for four, over forty years they've been at war with some country or another. But it would be nice to see the country calm down. Whether or not it can, it's up to the Afghan p- p- people and the government to decide that. But hopefully, cooler heads will pro- prevail, and it needs an Afghan solution for an Afghan problem. Mm. Western countries can't get too involved in it because if we do, we'll get bogged down. <clears throat> and the last thing we need to see is British or Western, Western troops back in Afghanistan again. Yes. Yes, they, they need an Af- Afghan solution to an Afghan problem. It would, would help if they like didn't get invaded again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot to ask here. So at what point in your captivity did the foreign office get, or did you get to hear that they were involved or how did you get the word out to them? Or, or is that what you just described to us? My family and I, uh, my fiance was actually talking. This is an unusual twist. My fiance was talking directly to the Taliban and she was talking directly to my interrogator. And she's re- recorded all of those phone calls. So it's very unusual to have a family member talking to the people who were keeping us captive. That's normally only the foreign office. So a lot of the family, well, a couple of the families, my fiance and the, they, they, they were helping basically to find out who needed to be spoken to, who was in charge, what was going on. Um, my fiancé was passing messages to me through the foreign office. We got a phone call to our families once every three or four weeks for a couple of minutes, 
five minutes, I think, as well, um, which is not a lot of time. And you've got to keep it. We're surrounded by our members of the Taliban, so we can't say anything untoward at all. So it's just basically all of us are alive, proof of life, try and persuade and negotiate, which was what the foreign office were trying to do at that time. And um, God, I got like a mil, a a a a, a billion questions, but. Well, were you, you say you were inter interrogated, can you tell us a bit more, about, was it just, you know, verbal, in, you said you got beaten, was this a regular thing or, or, or was was um, this a one-off? Did you get the idea that they, that you thought it might be over any, any moment now? Um, there was a couple of times where I was given a bit of a, a bit of a hard, hard time. Um, yes, I was beating. Um, a, a, according to international rule of law, I think a few things that happened to me is classed as torture. One of these times was five Taliban pin me down to the floor, handcuffed me, tied, tied me legs together, removed me shoes and socks, and whipped the bottom of my feet with a rubber hose. Uh, deserved, uh, received nerve damage to me right inside my body. At the same time that was happening, one of the Taliban's army boots was kicking me repeatedly in the ribs. So I suffered six cracked ribs, bruised kidneys, and a kidney infection as well. So I got a bit of a bit of an odd time of of like that. Um, asking me some really ad hoc questions, which didn't make a great deal of sense. And the guy interrogating me made it very clear he did not like uh, the British military, our country, and basically having a go at all that. So really, I didn't help myself either, because um, I kind of gave him a load of uh, verbal back, for want of a better word on it, told him to go for a, a, a jog. Um, at one point during an interrogation, um, I stood up, I was like, obviously, I'm mm -hmm. cuffed and that, and said, do you want me to go down the shop and I'll get you some crayons and I'll use some small words so you understand what I'm saying? Uh, I mean, so I got a hell of a kick in for that one as well. Um, yeah, so, but obviously, being a former vet, I'm not going to see uh, anybody who's going to have, have a go at, like, British vets or the British military. You know what I mean? Because I'm a patriot. End of. Um, so I gave him as much crap as what he gave in my direction as well. And what was their feeling towards you? What was their general position? Because you're basic there to get the guys out of the country, yeah. guys, guys and their families, but the, 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 the agents that have really been against them for 20 years and, 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 you know, you don't really go against the Taliban. That's, that, that's not, that's sort of unheard of. Um, as as, a, as an Afghan national, yeah. It's how, very, what what it's was, weird. yeah? What was their position towards you? At were they like, you know, did they accept that this is like a diplomatic thing, and and you know they've got to handle this properly, or were it they just? Took it took them a while to work it out. Me interrogator was a very young guy, a um, little bit of English. Not not very intelligent at the best of times. Um, just because he spoke a couple of words of English, he was given the job as an interrogator. Um, at one point, I actually said to him, why don't you write down the questions you want to ask everybody and then you're going to get a decent com conversation rather than trying to use broken English and him not realising or understanding a lot of the words that the guys like myself and the other British nationals were using, trying to explain everything. And every time we used a word he didn't know, he used to go into one because he, he thought we made him look stupid. Well, he was, end of. If you can't understand a word in English, then don't interrogate us in English. You know what I mean? Um, it's just basic common sense, isn't it? Mm. There was actually a split because so some of the Taliban hated us, end of. 
they would just want to just take us outside and put a bullet in the back of our heads. But the more senior Taliban, who were spoke very good English and they understood the English language as well, they wanted us out. We actually had seven senior ministers, including the Minister of Interior and the Foreign Minister, who wanted all the British nationals released quickly, got out of the country. But they didn't have the clout internally amongst the other Taliban, and it's a tr tribal element there. So you actually had half the Taliban wanted us dead and the other half wanted us uh, gone, like released. So it was a very difficult and very challenging dynamic to try and overcome. All we could do was touch base with the educated Taliban and actually speak to them and get them to touch base and speak to the foreign office. Mm -hmm. So eventually we actually did um, and it was successful and it worked. But there is a very disturbing um, element within what they call the Taliban, which is hardcore extremism. And that's more down the guidelines of, uh, if I'm allowed to say it, but Al-Qaeda. Um, and that is a l strong extremist element in that country. And the, the longer the West don't engage, then the extremism might take more root than what it is at this moment in time. The language, is it Urdu in, in Afghanistan? Uh, you got... Pashtun in the south and Dari in Parsi as well. Uh, and a lot of the uh, senior members of the Taliban speak Arabic. And Arabic, so, yeah, of course. It's and it's are, are, are you of a mixture. And do you speak a bit of that now then? I'm guess I'm guessing you I'm not fluent in ev every one of the one of the uh, languages or dialects, but I know enough to get to get 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 by mm. for one of them or the better, better word on it. Um, but I was very surprised at how good some of the senior members, especially the foreign ministry, um, there's a few guys in there that speak very good English. And I mean, they understand it as well. So you can have a very top-end conversation with these guys. I actually sat with the head of Afghan intelligence one evening and I was drinking tea in his office because I thought I was going to get another kick in. And in the middle of the night, I was taken upstairs, sat down. And I thought, all right, well, this is going to be, this is going to get emotional. And we just sat there drinking tea. Um, he wanted to know about politics, perspective. He wanted to know what was going on in the West. What, how does the West perceive them? And he was telling me about how they perceive the West. Very different kind of, I would call it a very honest, open conversation. And if senior members of the Taliban can have a conversation like that with me, there is a good possibility they might have it with other Western government officials. Mm. Um, that there is an element there that actually knows if they don't get this right, then there will be civil war within six months. So the Taliban aren't just trying to deal with internal issues in the country, internal issues within their, their own organisation as well, and they're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to deal with the West as, as well. Mm. The situation in Afghanistan, it could be, it's a bit of an unusual one because the hard miners from Kandahar, you might find that the country in the near future could be split into different areas. Um, the south will be Taliban. The north could very well be Haqqani, led with, obviously, the northern tribes there as, as well, because people in the north, and there is members of the Taliban and the Haqqanis who want women to be educated. Now, this is a very strong political point at the moment. Not every member of the Taliban doesn't want their children to be educated. A lot of them do. And a lot of people don't realise this, but it's the hardliners from, from Kandahar that the older ones that don't want the girls to be, to be educated. So the Taliban from Kandahar are like dragging 
the Taliban movement or the Afghan government back in time when there's an element within the Taliban umbrella that want the girls to go back to school. It's positive that they need females to be trained as doctors, as nurses in universities as well. So it'd be very interesting in the not too distant future if the hardliners are outnumbered by the more progressive young ones. Because mm -hmm. yeah, this is not 2002 anymore. Technology has come on a long way. Every Taliban I saw had a smartphone, which means you have access to the internet. They were listening to music. They were watching the news internationally as well. So these are very tech-savvy young ones, and they're not going to want to take a step back in time. These are the generation who want to take a step forward. Mm. So it'd be very interesting to see the next six months what, what progression can be made within Afghanistan. Have any of your torturers tried to add you as a friend on Facebook? Um, I actually shook the hand of one of the guys, um, and he was a young guy as well, and he was following orders. And if he hadn't have kicked me the way he did, he would have ended up in prison, if not shot. Mm. So on the way out, because he was a young guy, and he's got a young kid as well now, he's got a three-month-year-old boy as well, shook his hand, said, I don't have a problem, but if you meet any Westerners in the future, treat them a little bit better. And he actually apologised as well. Mm. Yeah, so I'm just highlighting the the bizarreness of these situations <laughs> that can that can occur. I, it it, it, re, it remind me that I met two. Um, I think they were Canadian boys, and they were oil riggers out there earning a fortune. You know, drilling the sea in the Mexican Gulf or whatever, and and. Uh, they used to spend all their money on beer and traveling. And one time they, they got on a yacht to uh, Jamaica and because they hitchhiked a ride on a yacht, they didn't have any return like airfare. They just rocked up in Jamaica. And next thing you knew, and, and this was a recognized thing where a member of the local police force would come down to the docks, check everyone's passports. And, if they didn't have an immigration stamp, they'd say, oh, come with me. We'll, we'll fix that for you. And he'd take them straight to the prison, whereupon they'd be charged with illegal immigration because you haven't got an air ticket out of here, right? Yeah. So the, these two Chinese, uh, the, sorry, Chinese, the, the, these two Canadian lads are, are locked up in, in, in this, um, uh, what, what's the capital of Jamaica called? It's, um, Ah, anyway, sorry. <laughs> Somebody put it in the comments, folks. I'm having a grey moment, but uh, anyway, so they're they're locked up there. In they said they're in this basement, like a dungeon underneath the prison, and they're locked in there with rapists, murderers, people that you know stab people, and and they said they kept themselves to themselves. Didn't want to, didn't want to interact. You know, didn't want to draw any attention to himself. And uh, they said all, all these guys used to form these these local Jamaicans would form a circle and they they spark up a joint and pass it around the circle and these two Canadians were like oh actually maybe maybe we will join you guys <laughs> the way they told me this story it's one of the funniest things I ever ever heard and finally after getting like beaten and abused they got taken the cash point they had to empty the cash point and give it to these corrupt coppers they had to, they took them to a travel agent they had to buy a ticket which they promptly then cancelled and, and hid out on the beach for like 10 days before they could sail out again right and um they said after the police had done all this to them they're walking down the street one day and the chief of police is coming the other way and he's like, hey, hi, guys. How, how are you all doing? <laughs> and they're like, you fucker. <laughs> You've just been like torturing us. We've been un locked up in your prison for doing absolutely nothing. You've emptied our bank accounts. And now you're like, hi, guys. So sorry, my, my, my mind just cross-threaded there a bit. Um, the, the, I, I can imagine the absurdity of people like who 
who gave you a hard time then then going, oh, I'll just add you on Facebook as well. What finally secured your release or what led to your, your release? Our release was a lot of work by the families, the British Foreign Office, and seven other countries that helped secure our release, our freedom, including um, a direct or a message from the President of the United States officially demanded that the Taliban release the six British nationals and obviously the one American there as well. So he didn't have to do that. We're not American, but he put his um, he threw his hat in the ring on that one. And there was a lot of incredible work done by members of the Foreign Office. And I would like to say that because the guys in the Foreign Office, I've given them a hard time in the past, but the old guys have gone. There's a lot of new people in the Foreign Office now. Um, and the head of the Afghan desk worked round the clock with his team to secure, help secure our release. And the way they looked after the families, and when we come back to England as well, we were met at the at the um, at the airport, and we were whisked through um, in a private area, and we were given a private room at the airport, each of us to meet our f families, so we didn't have to go through the normal procedure or go through the arrivals gate or anything like that as well. So a big th thank you there to all the countries who helped us, and obviously members of the foreign office good do they let you bring a suitcase of hash back as well um <laughs> no do they because you've been in prison in afghanistan right yeah i spent Is... three years when i was working with the americans in polish shaggy yeah and obviously you know it's quite well known that in islamic countries people don't drink or at least they don't drink in they don't let the public know that they drink. Um, you know, there, there are ways to get hold of alcohol, I think, in many of these places. Well, that was my experience when we we, we drove to India. But um, what you do see a lot is smoke, smoking hash in, in the Middle East. Is, is is that something they're allowed to do in the, in the prisons? Or is that... Um, the British nationals didn't have anything to do with any of that, any of us, but... You could smell it. Okay. In the prison. Yeah. So the guards did partake in that particular thing upon occasion. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Sorry, I just I got a, a very curious nature and about the the planet and uh, my experiences of it. Um. How was it settling back? Have you been? Is besieged the word by the press? You know how? No, the my name was not released again. A uh, big thank you to the phone office there. They contacted the papers, the editors, and said, um, obviously, me and my family didn't want our names at all mentioned while I was in Afghanistan. When I returned to Afghanistan, that offer was still on the on on the table, but I knew that my name would come out at some point anyway. You can't vanish off the face of the planet for nine months and nobody starts asking any questions. A lot of the editors, a lot of the press that I actually personally already know, already knew that what had happened or the, or the basics of it. So I made the decision myself to go public with what had happened, why it had happened, and the timeframes involved in it. Because that way people get to actually know what happened, why it happened, and they get to know the facts of it, rather than, obviously, you know yourself, Chris, sometimes people put two on two on social media and get ten. So I thought, let's get it out now. This is what happened, and that's, and, and that's the end of it. Didn't think it was that much of a big deal, but obviously being kept in a underground Taliban interrogation centre for six months, it was a bit of an interesting one. So hopefully now, obviously speaking about it again, I hope some people can learn from my experience and the fact of the British government and other countries now know the right members of the Taliban to open up some kind of a di dialogue with. Don't have to recognise them, open up a dialogue. Um, 
some good has and will come out of this. Mm. But time will actually tell what happens in Af Afghanistan now. Did you, um, I'm looking at the photo here of you, and um, it's in a mirror online, and I think it has to be said you when when you when you've got the traditional Afghan dress on. I'll, yeah, can you pass for a national? Uh, yeah, myself and my colleague, we were walking around the bazaar, the markets. We even had members of the Taliban came up to us one time when we're in the local market asking us for directions. Um, so yeah, we can pass quite quite easily. As long as we don't speak English. Yeah, of course. That that kind of yeah, a, yeah. Yeah, I'm just sorry, I'm just making a note here for Luke if he can put that photo in the thing. And are you standing is that a hind helicopter you're standing next to? It is, yeah. God, they were some machines, weren't they? Yeah, I think there's still some uh, there's still a couple of them floating around. That particular one was a really old one. I think that was in the museum in Kabul. Mm. But it was a very iconic one, so I wanted to get a picture of that. Yeah, they were the sort of, uh, you know, original Russian gunships, weren't they? Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Gosh. And listen, it's been great chatting. It's going to be uh, great to see you next month and also later this month. We might have a slight issue for the photo shoot. I got the same jacket as you. Ah, I might have a different one at that point. <laughs> Happy and day. It, and it's the only real one that I've got. Well, I've got a few, but it's the only one I really wear. Um, and uh, how can people get hold of you if they want to get hold of you? Obviously, we'll we'll put links below, but. Feel free to shout yeah. anything that you want now and also your book. I think well, anyone who wants to get, get hold of me, all you do is type Anthony Stephen Malone into the internet. It'll it'll bring you to my webpage, Facebook, Insta. My main um, website is www.anthonymalone.me.uk. That'll give you the full backstory and everything that's going on. Also, the links to, to my books, my new book, Hostage evacuation will be out on the 8th of September. I hope people enjoy that as well. It's both informative and emotional. And thank you for everyone for watching um, Chris and his amazing podcast. Yes, and I, I will second that. And um, Massive thank you. Um, good luck with the book. It's, uh, it's no mean challenge to get a book out at the best of times. And, uh, and uh yeah, I bet you've been writing your ass off, haven't you? Yeah, myself and a lot of other people have been helping me as well. This is going to be an unusual book because it's got a lot about Afghan Afghan women's rights in there, written by some young ladies who have spent a long time in Afghanistan, who are Afghan, and some of my friends in the United Nations and obviously the American government as well. So it is going to be a very informative, detailed book about everything that's happening out there. Yes. Get, chuck us a link for it as soon as you get it up on Amazon or wherever you're going to retail it. Uh, brilliant. All right, and what, as I said, well, stay on the line just so I can thank you properly. But for the purposes of the tape, massive thank you again. Um, friends at home. Wow. I think I might go and dig over the potatoes now massive thank you um for watching you. if you can like and share subscribe that'll be wonderful please look after yourself we'll see you soon thank you Stay safe.